Thank you so much for tuning in to Cultivate Hub DFW. We're here in Dallas, Texas, and we meet every Sunday at 3 p.m. Hopefully, this sermon impacts you and draws you closer to God. Our mission is to equip believers, empower families, embrace the community, and expand the kingdom. And I believe that this sermon should challenge you to do the same. I want you to click the subscribe button and turn on the notifications so that you can be informed anytime we're having something. I want you to pray for us and partner with us through giving. Our giving information is on the screen, and I believe that what God is doing here is not just going to cultivate the DFW, but cultivate the world. Everybody knows I feel healing in this room. Come on. Sing it out with your strength. Sing it. We give you Uh-huh. You're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. Come on, I need everybody to sing this one. We give you all. all we worship you, we worship you. Hey, Bob. Sula Matala made a little movie on the Labahaya. Come on, you ought to lift your hands and lift your voice and sing straight to Jesus. From your heart, sing, we give you all.
this room today because we want something from you. Oh, we recognize, Jesus, that you are the only one can do what we need done. So we lift our voice to you. We lift our hands to you. We lift our eyes to you because only you can heal us. Only you can touch us. Only you can transform us. So let our worship be a sign that we're ready for change. We're ready for something new. We're ready for transformation. We're ready for our new season. May old things be passed away forever. Bring us into a new place. If you're ready for something new, if you're tired of the old and want to experience something new from God, I dare you to put your hands together and give God the best shout of praise that you can give him. Some of y'all looking, you ain't shouting. I want you to go to three people. I want you to tell them, say, hey, neighbor. Welcome to your new season. Come on, find three people. Don't you look crazy. I want you to find somebody. We don't bite. And tell them, welcome to your new season. Type it online. Tag somebody you don't know. And tell them, welcome to your new season. Hold on, musicians. Somebody just made a declaration to you, and your response tells me that you yet, you don't believe it. When somebody makes a declaration, the way you let the devil know that I believe that I'm getting ready to walk into my new season is that you open your mouth and let a praise out of your lips that defies your current circumstances. Let me help you understand the power of praise. Praise is powerful when you praise outside of what you feel. Let me tell you, praise is powerful when you praise outside of your circumstances. What are you talking about, Solomon? When things don't look the way you need them to look, I owe God a praise anyway. Money looking funny, I owe him a praise. Change looking strange, I owe him a praise. I need a few believers in this room. No matter what praise in their belly To open up your mouth And say no matter what He's worthy No matter what He's good No matter what I will bless the Lord At all times And His praises Shall continually Be in my mouth My soul Shall make a boast of the Lord
I have at least 15 believers in this room that will say, come what may, I still have a yes in my soul. Somebody ought to wave. If that's you, just say, come what may, it's still yes. Find somebody and say, come what may, it's still yes. It's still yes. to fight. That means that sometimes in environments like this, when you get serious about the praise, that you can clap your way into breakthrough. There are some things that you won't have to fight in the physical and in your emotions if you would just praise him with a clap. He's trained my fingers to walk and my hands to fight. I'm clapping like the devil's in between them. I'm clapping because my next level is on the way. I'm clapping because I believe my deliverance is right around the corner. Everybody clap. intercessory praise the Bible says that there was a story about two men about by the name of Paul and Silas Paul and Silas were in prison they were in captivity they were stuck on one level they couldn't go to a new place because they were in bondage sounds like some of you in this room but I'm gonna help you the Bible says that Paul and Silas didn't fight the guard they didn't look for the key the Bible says that they found themselves in a posture of praise and not only did they get their breakthrough but everybody in the vicinity got free as well I wish I had some non-selfish praisers that would run down here to this altar and not only praise God for everybody in this room, but praise God for everybody with your last name. Because the praise that you give him today is going to change some things in your bloodline. One, two, three, praise!
Would you lift your hands for me? I heard the Lord for you. The Lord said, I'm getting ready to fight on your behalf. I feel like you've been experiencing a lot of opposition and things that have tried to keep you from moving forward in your emotions specifically. God says, I'm getting ready to deal with disappointment and I'm getting ready to bring you to another level of joy. You're getting ready to see everything that you've been praying about manifest right before your face. And it's going to be a sign that God did it for you. You're not going to have to strive. You're not going to have to fight. You're not going to have to worry. And it's not going to cost you a dime. God said, I'm getting ready to do it for you because you love me. And I love you. I wish some people in this room would get excited for my sister. I said, God is fighting for her.
it for Billy, but if you want to receive it, I dare you to just grab it. Lift your hands, Billy. I don't know what this means to you, but I... Billy, don't stand in my chair, Billy. Don't fall. You ain't getting nothing but a Band-Aid, okay? But I heard the Lord say, compound interest. The Lord said, there have been some investments that you've made, not even financially, but the Lord said, you've made some emotional and some time investments into some other people, and you did it counted as a seed, but God said, I did. And the Lord said, because you did it with a pure heart, you're getting ready to run into a season. I wish some other people would grab hold to this. You're getting ready to run into a season called compound interest. Everything that you sold, it's harvest time. Somebody ought to shout for harvest time in your life. say he's getting ready to give you more time the enemies have been trying to exhaust you under time constraints but I saw you and I heard the Lord say tell her I'm gonna give her flexibility to do the dream that she has in her heart because I see a nonprofit that's gonna come out of you and the Lord said I'm gonna cause you to use your story of rejection and abandonment and I'm gonna cause you to use your story to bring other people out but the Lord says in order for me to do that I have to cause those around you to loosen some of the reins on you. God said, I'm getting ready to give you strength, strategy, and flexibility. Lift your hands. Father, I pray now by the power of the Holy Ghost that everything that the enemy would try to use to keep her tied up and bound up and, and, and constrained to one season, I pray now that this would be a season that she would be shot into her next place. I decree and declare acceleration over her and every other person in the room that would lift their voice and shout right now. Acceleration. You're getting ready to go faster than you've ever gone before. You're getting ready to make up for lost time. One more time. Everybody clap now. There's something in that clapping. I feel like doors are being opened in the spirit as you clap your hands.
Carnegie family, Carnegie, Carnegie family. Anybody in here or online? I want us to intercede for the Carnegie family. Anybody in here by the last name Carnegie? Related to some car, I keep hearing that specifically. I want to pray for the Carnegie family. Would you intercede for me for with me for a moment? Father, I thank you that every person attached to the Carnegie bloodline would begin to experience transformation and change. I thank you that old things are passed away and we receive the new. Come on, intercede with me for that family. I don't need confirmation. I know what I heard. Now I need you to pray for your family because that praise wasn't for you. It was for everybody connected to you. I release blessing and strategy, strength and transformation over the Carnegie family. Spirit is here. I believe praise has tilled the ground. Please take your seats. Something has to break. I don't even know that. 
that song, but I hear it. Something has to break. Genesis 26. Come on, type it online. Genesis 26. feel God, just wave your hand. We thank him for his presence. He doesn't have to show up anywhere. And we're so grateful that he decided to show up here. I want you to look at somebody who's cried their eyelashes off and tell them, I'm glad you're in church. Tell them. I'm so glad you're in church. Find somebody you don't know and tell them I'm so, your makeup is running, but I'm so glad you're in church. Lipstick smudged a little bit, but I'm so glad. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Genesis 26, 17. We're beginning a new sermon series today. I'm going to give you this short first installment. Amen. I'm going to try not to lie to y'all. But this one was good to me, so I'm going to try to make this short. Amen. We're in a new series called Rehab. Everybody say Rehab. We have been in a series on the glory, and now we're entering into this series. The Lord spoke to me about 2025, and he told me to prepare the people for 2025 because 2025 was going to be the year for the healed. I'll say that again. 2025 is going to be for people who do the soul work. Not just mask and act like you're okay, but who really do the work to be okay. Amen? So all month long, we're teaching on inner healing and emotional wellness. Because what I found is church people love to praise, shout, and sing over soul wounds. Genesis 26, 17. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father called them. Also, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac, because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well. And they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth. Because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. I want you to take a seat for a moment. Today, we need to have 
a much needed conversation about inner healing and emotional wellness, which is why we've entered into this rehabilitation series, because I believe that God wants to have a conversation about destinies delayed due to damaged souls. I'm going to say that again. Y'all know I love alliteration. Write it down. God wants to have a conversation with believers whose destinies have been delayed due to damaged souls. Your mind, will, and emotions are scarred and wounded, and it's causing the destiny which you were put in this earth to reach to be delayed. Uh, it's something that we have to talk about because in our path to promise, sometimes the things that we refuse to confront become obstacles. It is human nature to work overtime to avoid pain. It is human nature to work overtime to learn how to escape discomfort. And what I found in my study and in my time as a deliverance minister and being married to my beautiful wife who's a therapist, one thing that I found is that we all develop a specific skill. Now, it may manifest in different ways in each of our lives, but each and every one learn to develop a skill to protect ourselves from discomfort. Each of us learns how to bury things. We learn how to cover things up so that we can keep on living. Y'all already getting tight on me. I know we was just praising just a moment ago, but I need you to take a deep breath. One, more, one, one two, three, take a deep breath. Because we're going we're gonna to get you this victory whether you want it or not. Amen. It is a necessary thing that each and every believer with a prophetic promise has to do. You have to do soul work because many of us have spiritual graveyards holding our purpose, destinies, opportunities, and plans hostage because you've buried some things. I say it all the time, I need you to grab this hurt buried alive doesn't die. It festers. And the thing that you refuse to confront in the next season at the most uh, 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 uncomfortable time will come up and bite you when you least expect it. This is what we're seeing in the exposure that's sweeping across America in churches large and small. I only speak about churches because I'm not in the entertainment in in industry. I have nothing to say about Diddy, but um, yeah, that's all I got to say. I have nothing to say about Diddy. But in the church, we're seeing so much exposure happen from top to bottom, from big to small. We are seeing so much exposure happen because God is finally dealing with things in men that elevate it but they never dug they grew in influence but they never dug it up they got more money but they never dug in order for you To find the hope that you need to become what God called you to be, you're going to have to go to your spiritual graveyard. You're going to have to get a shovel, and you're going to have to work the graveyard shift. And you're going to have to dig it up. I want you to turn to your neighbor. That's the title of my message today. Uh, We got a little work to do. Just, Just shout it at your neighbor and say, dig it up. Dig up the thing that you buried because you were embarrassed. Dig up the thing that you avoided because you didn't want to deal with it. I know we just danced, but you can't dance over this one. You got to dig it up. I know we just praised, but you can't shout this one away. You got to dig it up. I know you come to church week after week, but a sermon is not therapy. You've got to dig. It up. I know your favorite mentorship programs are amazing, but they're not therapy. You got to sit down with somebody and you got to allow them to give you a spiritual, mental, and emotional shovel, and you've got to dig it up. I want you to say it one more time. Say, dig it up. 
I need to say this to you. Avoidance is not deliverance. The thing that you bury because you don't want to see it doesn't go away. It takes root. Suppression is not transformation. The thing that you ignore doesn't do anything but ferment underground. It just gets stronger. Everybody say dig it up. I need you to dig it up because 2025, I'm going to make this prophetic declaration over you. I wish you would grab it. 2025 is getting ready to see the most healed version of you that you've ever been. You're getting ready to see the version of you that's finally going to shake the world. You didn't survive just to get in a graveyard and go to sleep. You survived everything that you survived so that you could tell the story of how you got over. You dug up. You did the work. Now, 2025 25 is getting ready to see the version of you that can handle anything. I wish you would find your neighbor and shake them real good and say, I'm getting ready to be stronger than ever. I'm getting ready to have more strength than you've ever. You're getting ready to meet the best version of me. You're getting ready to meet the version of me that God intended in his mind. I came into this world as a weapon of mass destruction. And I know you've been seeing me at quiet timid and shy but there's a lion of Judah on the inside of me and I'm getting ready for 2025 to let that lion roar out of me I'm getting ready to go through some work I'm getting ready you're getting ready to see the best version of me put your hand on yourself and say I'm I'm getting ready to see the best version of me Turn to somebody behind you and say, you're getting ready to meet the best version of me. If you didn't like me before, you might as well pack your bags and find somewhere else to go. Because if you can't stand this broken version of me, you ain't going to be able to stomach the thing that I'm getting ready to become. You get prepared. I love to say it like my sister Kim. Prepare to be sick of me. That's what inner healing is all about. Inner healing is all about digging up things that you've buried. You know where your hiding spots are in your heart. You know the conversations that you don't want to have. You know how you hide. You try to spiritually hide when the prophet starts looking around the room and seeing you. You know the emotion that you, you, you know where your graveyard is. Inner healing is about dealing with the things that you've buried, but that's not it. <laughs> In order to become version of you 2025, not only do you have to dig up the things that you've buried, but you're also going to have to dig up things that didn't start with you. Sometimes your destiny is locked in a spiritual cemetery that you didn't create. <laughs> Sometimes your purpose is in a spiritual prison that started with your parents. The absent parent. The abusive relative. The dysfunctional home. Is it fair that in order to reach your destiny, not only do you have to deal with your stuff, but why does God design it to where I, I got to deal with my daddy's devils too? I got to deal with my mama's dysfunctions as well. I got to battle my grandmother's insecurities. Shout it out, say, dig it up. We love the promise of being what 2025 isn't ready for, but we don't like the process to become what God. It's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. You didn't start it, but it is your responsibility to finish it. 
there have been some things that have been sliding through your bloodline for generation after generation. You didn't start it. You didn't make the agreement, but you're going to be the curse breaker. You didn't make the addiction, but you're going to be the one that the buck stops here. The reason that I've got to be the one is because somebody has got to stop this thing from traveling on my last name. Somebody has to stand up and say, I'm going to be the plot twist. I'm not going to go down the same way my daddy and my granddaddy went down. I'm not going to fall in the same traps. I'm going to do the work and I'm going to dig it up. Deliverance is what you dig up. Inner healing is understanding how it got there. I'm going to say that again. Deliverance is what you dig up. Inner healing is learning how it got there. Because some of the stuff you're fighting didn't start with you. They don't like you, but they didn't start with you. Isaac found himself in a very peculiar situation. Isaac found himself, I love a, I love a good amen corner. Yo, you're going to make me preach, man. Isaac found himself in a very peculiar situation because he fell into the same pattern that his daddy Abraham fell into. The Bible tells us in Genesis 20, this is before we get to Genesis 26, six chapters before Isaac ends up in the land of Gerar digging up wells, he found that his father found himself in the exact same situation, running from the exact same problem. In Genesis 20, Abraham ran to the land of Gerar because he was running from a famine. And here we are, one generation later, Isaac is now in Genesis 26 in the land of Gerar, running from a famine. He didn't just go to the same region as his daddy, Pastor Al. He went to the same city <laughs> that his daddy went to. Not you, Siri. He went to the same city that his daddy went to. Not only did he go to the same city that, he, that his daddy went to, he found himself facing the same man that his daddy ran into Abraham in Genesis 20 ran into the land of Gerar and faced Abimelech the king Isaac in gener in a generation later in Genesis 26 ran to Abimelech the king from the land of into the land of Gerar running from famine not only not only do, did he run from the same thing to the same place and face the same man, he also found himself battling the same fears. You got to read the Bible. Abraham got to the land of Gerar and got scared because his wife was fine. And he said, these men are, are violent. And, and if I tell them that this is my wife, they're going to kill me and take her. So I'm going to tell them, oh, no, this is my, this is my sister. <laughs> A generation later, Isaac finds himself. You got to read the whole chapter. Isaac finds himself in the same land, running from the same thing, facing the same man with the same fear. Isaac did the same thing that his daddy. He deceived the king of Abimelech the same way that his daddy deceived. He said, you know what? This woman, Rebecca... She's a dime. She's top of the line. She's got a cute face. Of, you know, y'all know the rest. I, 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 this is my sister. He told the same lie. He fell into the same deception. And I wonder if the deception that Isaac reaped in Genesis 25 was a result of this generational deception that came from Abraham. Genesis 20, 20 
I'm just giving you context. Genesis 20, Abraham deceived Abimelech. Genesis 25, Rebekah deceives Isaac. The Bible says Isaac had got old and blind. And she brought in these two boys by the name of Jacob and Esau. She favored Jacob, but she didn't care too much for Esau. Isaac favored Esau. And so the same deception that Isaac sold with his daddy in Genesis 20, he reaped in his sons. I wonder what you're reaping that started with your daddy. Genesis 25, his hands are switched. Unbeknownst to him, he thought he was putting a blessing on his oldest son. And he ends up putting a blessing on the underdog. But I need you to take courage from Genesis 25. We're going back to Genesis 26. But I need you to know that God favors the underdog too. I know you may have been the black sheep of the family. I know you don't do anything like anybody else in the family. The rest of them do things a different way. You might not even have the same last name. But the favor is on you anyway. God switched the hands. They thought that it would go to the cousin. They thought it would go to somebody else. But the favor is on you. I wish you would just put your hand over your head and say the favor is on me here we have Isaac in the land of Gerar the same land that his daddy was in fighting the same people that his daddy fought battling the same fears that his daddy battled and God commands Isaac to do something so that he can get his inheritance <laughs> Abraham wasn't just a nomad and a wanderer. Abraham was a very wealthy businessman, and he left an inheritance in the land. And Isaac, in a time of famine, knew that I got to go get what belongs to me. Some of you need to be ready to do the work because you got to go and get what belongs to you. Somebody just shout, dig it up. He said, I, I, I got to go back to Gerard because my daddy left some resources there for me. I got to go back to the land of Gerard. And the Bible tells us that he was running from the famine in the land that he was in. And he found himself in, in the same place that his daddy was in. And we find out through study that actually the Lord sent him home. If you do the research... Isaac wasn't born in the land of Canaan. If you study, you'll find Isaac was actually born in the land of Gerar. Sometimes before you can get to your destiny, God sends you back home. He sends you back to some foundational. Y'all don't like it, but this is why therapists first ask you about your relationship with your mother and your father. They start asking you about your siblings. They start asking you about your immediate family and your relatives. They want to know what home was like for you. And before you can get to your destiny, your future, and your promise, you've got to make a stop back by home. You got to go to your foundation. You got to have conversations with people who look like you. Everybody, y'all, I'm telling you, you're going to come to church, come to church all month. You're going to get some, you're going to get some deliverance. <laughs> His obedience to follow God back to an uncomfortable home. He didn't go home. He wasn't welcome like the prodigal son was welcome when he came home. The Bible says that he was fearful that these people were going to kill him, but God made him go. Anyway, sometimes God will challenge you to go into places that make you scared, but you've got to do it scared. You've got to do it anyway. You've got to face the thing. You've got to, you've got to break up the fallow ground, and you've got to dig it up. You've not thought about it for years, but what's home like for you?
you've not you've not thought about them for years but what's the condition of your family you don't respond in any group chat But how are the people with your last name? In order for you to create the right legacy, you've got to go back home. Isaac found himself in this very situation. Isaac had to leave a place where he had built himself and his family a life. He had become prosperous and wealthy. and He had built something that, was, that should have been sustainable. But God allowed a famine to hit the land so that Isaac could be pushed into a confrontational place. Some of you don't like the direction that your life is right now. But God pushed you there so that you can confront some things. Y'all don't like me. It's okay. I'm going to preach to the people online. Sometimes God will push you into uncomfortable places and into uncomfortable seasons so that he can challenge you to finally dig it up. Isaac was sent to the land of Gerar to face his father's fears, to face his father's enemies, to face the same, running from the same famine that his father was running from so that he could redig the things that his father started. The Bible says that Isaac had to go and dig it up. Inner healing it's hard because sometimes in order to heal, you've got to start over. Y'all don't like me. Maybe I should sit down here on the altar. Sometimes in order to heal, healing is hard, but healing is hard because you've got to remember. I don't want to think about that it was a defining moment for you whether you like it or not it helped shape your soul and you can't tuck it away and move on with your life like it never happened you've got to go back and you've got to dig it up if I was one of them prop preachers I would have a, a shovel and a little box of dirt in here so that I could show you that digging takes work Digging is backbreaking. Digging is uncomfortable. Digging is dirty. When you start digging, you don't get to present yourself as this perfect, polished presentation anymore. When you start digging, you got to start getting into the nitty gritty. You've got to find yourself ready to knock if you buck. When you find yourself in the position to dig, I, I, I wish some people understood what soul work really felt like. Sometimes you've got to dig if you want to heal for real. Real healing is hard, number one, because you got to start from the beginning. Isaac had to go back home to the place that he was born, and he had to confront some things that his daddy started. And are you with me? Digging is hard. Inner healing is hard because... It challenges you to have some hard conversations. You think that you're going to heal on mute. <laughs> you think that time is just going to make it go away. No, healing requires conflict. The Bible says on his journey to dig it up, he was met with conflict at a place called Isaac. Isaac was a well. He was trying to get to his place of inheritance. Isaac was trying to get to the resources that were promised to him. Isaac was trying 
to move past the famine and move on with his life. But God said, uh, Isaac, you can't move on with your life until you have some necessary conversations. I want you to get ready this month because as you sit under this teaching and as you sit under this anointing to heal, God is going to challenge you. Don't, don't grab your bags, prophet. God is going to challenge you. God is going to challenge you to have some uncomfortable conversation. The first whale that Isaac had to stop at was a whale that challenged him to have a conversation with people who were trying to block him. He had to have a conversation with people who didn't want his well dug up. Hard conversations are necessary. And in order for them to be fruitful, you're going to have to stop plastic, passing blame and take accountability for your stuff. Somebody say, heal me, Lord. Because we love to be the victim, but we don't like to tell the times in the story where we were the villain. Oh, yeah. In somebody's story, you were the villain. You were the big bad wolf. You were blowing their house down. In somebody's story, you were the wicked witch. You were saying things out of bitterness and out of anger and out of resentment. And you were cursing their destiny and their life. In somebody's story, you were the victim. You were the, vi the villain and not the victim. got to have hard conversations. Hard conversations are, are uncomfortable because it makes you slow down and identify where was the disconnect. <laughs> On your healing journey, write this question down. Where was the first disconnect? When was the first time you felt numb? When was the first time your anger got the better of you? When was the first time you went off and blacked out? When was the first time you lost control? When was the first time you built up those walls? What caused you to develop this defense mechanism? Who hurt you? Somebody say Isaac. It was the first will. I know. I know this is tough. God told me to take y'all through some inner healing because your destiny is right at the door. Your destiny is behind the dig. God is trying to get something to you and he's trying to get something through you, but it can't happen if you don't dig it up. Inner healing is hard. Number one, because you got to start from the beginning. Number two, because you got to have some necessary conflict. Number three, inner healing is hard because you've got to progress in spite of opposition. That means that while you're digging, you may have to defend yourself, but you can't stop digging. While you're digging, life doesn't stop. People may accuse you, but you can't stop digging. Bills may look strange, but you can't stop digging. You don't get to stop living life according to purpose just because you're doing some inner healing work. And that's what's wrong with this generation of believers. We want everything to stop so that we can heal. But what we see in the life of Isaac as he traveled through the land of Gerar and he dug up the wells of his father Abraham. He stopped at Isaac and he found himself quarreling with the people. They begin to say this water is ours and he had to fight for his right to dig. Then we saw him at well number two and well number two was called Sitna because as he, he had already done some digging work, he had more to do but while he was digging, they were fighting him. Has anybody ever been in a situation that while I'm trying to get myself together, I'm trying to be the best version of me possible. I'm trying to stop using these words. I'm trying to not put my hands on. 
Oh, oh, I'm trying to allow God to heal what's going on in the inside of me. While I'm doing this, you want to try me. You, 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 you trying to test my gangster. You, you want to see the old me. I'm trying to keep it buried, but you trying to make me act up. And sometimes God takes you back to the land of Gerard so that you can dig the old you up. Because the old you isn't the version that he created. It's the version of you that you created to defend yourself. And God wants you to dig it up so that you can bury it again. No, not just to bury it, to hide it. You got to bury it this time to commit it. You got to kill it and let it die. There are some things that you are waiting. You got a plan B in your pocket. If they try me on this job one more time, if she say one more wrong thing to me, I am going to, I'm getting ready to show out. No, God says, I want you to heal for real. And I want you to kill that version of you that that shows out. I'm preaching to myself now. God wants you to kill the version of you that goes off when you're triggered. You can't help being triggered, but you can help the response. God wants you to kill that version of you that sends that text when you get. If you can't say amen, say ouch. God help. He had to stop at Sitna. Sitna shows us how Isaac handled offense. Because they were try they were fighting against him and he kept digging. They were quarreling with him, they were arguing with him, they were striving against him, and he was digging and defending. Digging and choosing the right words to say. Digging and arguing. Digging but moving forward. Many of you keep trying to move forward without digging. And many of you are trying to dig and not move forward. You don't get to stop either or. It's both and. You got to dig into the thing that God wants you to heal from and you got to be productive. You don't get to stop and be depressed and lay in the bed all day just because you're doing some. No, 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 no. Get yourself up. Wash your face. Brush your teeth. Floss as well and brush your tongue because your breath can be a little and, and sometimes you need to get up, wash yourself and become productive. I know you're digging and I know the work is hard but you don't get to stop life because God is doing something in your soul shout it out in the room say get up and wash yourself let some hot water run down your body because that's what the enemy tries to do he tries to get you so depressed and so stuck in your own soul trauma that you don't care about how you smell actually I don't even smell it I'm so sunken down into this low place I'm so sucking down and my nose has gone blind to the must no God is trying to get you to do some real inner healing work and doing real inner healing work doesn't mean that you get to take a vacation to do it you got to dig and work. You can't take a break. Don't you take no FMLA. You got to dig. Don't you take no short-term leave because you're in a hard season. You got to dig. Somebody shout, dig it up. He stopped, and I'm almost done. He stopped at sitting there. Sitna means opposition. Because in, in order for you to, 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 to develop the muscle to handle your purpose, you got to experience some tension. 
Your purpose is huge. And God isn't allowing you, God isn't allowing you to dig just because he wants a hole in your soul. No, 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 no. He's trying to get you to dig so that you can develop the muscle to handle your purpose. You're developing the muscle to handle your future. You're developing in the season of digging, you develop an awareness. You develop a keen sight. You, de you develop a sharpness. You thought you could discern before, but when you begin to dig it up, you find out that you have another level of sensitivity. You find out that you have another level of insight. You find another level of strategy. When you start fighting for inner healing, you'll see the light at the end of the tunnel. And you'll realize that this season may be hard, but this season has an expiration date. I wish somebody would get excited because this hard season of digging has a purpose. And I'm getting ready to see the end of it. I'm going to do the digging. I'm going to do the work because I'm getting ready to see the end of the Bible says that after he made it through Issac and after he made it through Sitna, he found himself at another well. And the Bible says that at this well, he didn't have to fight. I'm getting ready to prophesy to you and I want you to receive it in your soul that God is getting ready to cause you to have sweatless victories. After you do the digging, I wish somebody would get excited. After you do the soul work, after you do the digging, after you do the thing that he challenged you to do, after you dig it up, God says, I'm going to take you through Isaac, but I'm just building your muscle. I'm going to take you through Sitna, but I'm just getting you ready. After you go through those two, you're going to come to a third place, by the name of Rehoboth. The Bible says that after he got through all of the digging, he finally was able to dig into his inheritance without struggle, without a fight, without conflict, without quarrel. And he came to a place called Rehoboth. And he said, I'm going to call this one Rehoboth because after all that I've been through, the Lord has finally made room for me. After all that I've dealt with in my mind, in my will and my emotion the Lord has made room for me I dug and defended myself I dug and worked through my problems I dug and healed and forgave people who probably didn't deserve my forgiveness but I dug anyway and now I've come to a new place called Rehoboth I've come to my open place because the Lord has made room for me I'm going to make you uncomfortable one more time before you shout about Rehoboth. I quite enjoy watching you squirm while I preach. The thing about digging in Isaac's situation and in your life is that Isaac didn't dig alone. If you can't say amen, say ouch. Isaac did not dig alone. He had a community of people around him, and they were helping him. I want you to know that your destiny is never going to be re reached if you keep trying to dig by yourself. You've got to give somebody else the shovel. You've got to point to the area where it's buried. You've got to tell them how much work you've done yourself and where you need help with. You cannot dig alone. Somebody shout dig with community. ain't got nowhere in your digging because you're digging by yourself. You exhausted because you want to heal in private. <laughs> you want everybody else to mind your own business. Let me tell you why your healing is not your own business because your destiny is not your own business. God put treasure in your earthen vessel and it's not about you Twinkie. It's about everybody around you that he wants to bless through you. It's about everybody around you that he loves. Your destiny is not your own business. Neither is your healing. David had to heal in front of the people that he led. Moses had to heal in front of the people that he led. Aaron had to heal in front of the people that he led. Jesus had to go to a mountain of transfiguration and become everything that God called him to be in front of the people that he led. Honey, if all of these great prophets of God had to do it, who are you? You don't get to heal behind the curtain. You got to heal in community. The Bible says 
that the last well that he dug was called Beersheba, Rehoboth. And while he was there, God cut a covenant with him. Play me something soft. I want you to lift your hands. I believe God wants to cut covenant with some of you. Because here's the thing about the work that Isaac did. Not only did he have to dig up his daddy's wells and face his daddy's fears. Not only did he have to do some real work. He also got his, his daddy's inheritance. He did the work and he was able to see more than Abraham was able to see. There are some promises over your family that some of your loved ones have died before they could see. If you dig up and do the work, you'll get ready to, you'll be able to see it in your lifetime. I want you to stand to your feet if you're ready for healing. challenge you to revisit some things and while you're revisiting these things you can't do it alone if somebody recognizes that you're digging and they come over and say hey what's wrong don't you tell them nothing don't you tell them I'm good you're delaying your destiny because of your damaged soul when somebody comes and say, hey, what's going on to you? Give them a shovel and allow them to dig with you. You can't dig it up by yourself. You can't dig it up when it's comfortable. You've got to dig it up. You've got to dig it up. I hope that that sermon blessed you. I hope you were impacted to grow closer to Christ. I hope you've got answered the questions and prayers that you've had before God. I want to encourage you to follow our social media page. Again, subscribe to this YouTube. And I want to ask you to give. I want you to sow into what we're doing here. We are a debt-free ministry. And I believe that God is going to use your generosity to make our ministry mobile. I believe we have a mandate to cultivate this world until earth looks like heaven. I want to pray for you. I want to thank you for what you've done. Father, bless every gift and every giver. Bless every seed and every sower. Let everything that they've partnered with us in prayer and through their generosity be answered. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Let men give unto them 100-fold of whatever they've sown into us. In Jesus' name, we pray and give thanks. Thank you. Can't wait to see you next week for our sermon series.